Welcome back to Yellow Belly Farm. I'm Connor. This is a bit of a winter episode. I'm sneaking in right before the end of the year. It's December 30th. We're probably in peak storm season. We had an awful one this morning, but there's been a bit of a break now. I don't think we're going to get wet so we can have a bit of a walk around. It is going to be windy, so I'm, I'm just conscious of the noise. Um, I'll try to minimize that as much as I can. So we might have a walk around, look at what the farm looks like this time of year. Bear in mind, this is still a very young farm, being run on a part-time basis, just finished second season. Uh, loads of plans for next year, which I'll talk about. Uh, we might actually, for the first time, have a look in, in this room, which is the wash and pack area and some of the crazy contraptions that um, I've set up for next year. So uh, let's go have a walk around. Don't tell anyone, but it's actually New Year's Day and I'm re-recording the outdoor section because um, it was too windy and I spent about an hour outside talking to nobody. Um, so today I've swapped wind for rain, slightly drizzling, but hopefully you can hear me. So let's get the outdoor bit done. Uh, so what you see behind me here is not a tragic pond. It's the new pond, which um, I dug with a friend about a month ago. Um, the reason I did it this time of year is because I got a grant from um, an organization called Farming for Nature. You might remember in a previous video, they assigned me a mentor who came up here and uh, walked around with him and got some great insights into his farm down in Kerry. So as part of that program, they um, then offered me a grant to dig a pond. A small amount, but enough to cover maybe the cost of the liner. And then for the machinery hire, I had a friend locally who came over. Um, and we basically got all of this done in a Friday evening and Saturday. And amazing, really. It was something I'm not able to do on a mini digger. Um, needs a lot of skill and agility and uh, my friend Mike pulled this off with ease. Um, so it's not just a pond, we've actually landscaped a little bit of area in here. You can kind of see there's a circular area there uh, which I'm planning to fill with stone. Um, build a couple of benches. You can see there's a bit of a pathway already going to come in here. So on this pathway, we're going to put down stone all the way in. Here's the kind of center circle. I've got some um, armored cable coming out here. It's going underground into the shed. It's not hooked up yet to anything, but that can potentially one day provide light or whatever music. And, and this is going to be a nice little area to just relax. So I'm thinking uh, some semicircular concrete seating here and here. And in the middle where I'm standing, something like um, a fire pit or barbecue. Um, and this can be just a really nice social area. On these banks here, there's a little bit more landscaping to be done, but um, we'll do some nice planting around all these banks and the one behind me here. Um, and some, some trees, like um, planning on getting some beech trees there. Um, so this pond itself, is approximately 10 meters by five meters. So it's a lot, lot bigger than the tragic pond down below, which um, basically it's baby brother. Um, and the difference with this pond is I've lined it with LDPE, which is a plastic. Um, and that was recommended to me by a wildlife specialist who I had a consultation with before digging the pond. Um, and it's um, so it's sandwiched by two layers of geotextile fabric. So on the bottom we put down the geotextile, put the LDPE um, plastic over that, and then one more layer of um, geotextile fabric, and then put down uh, maybe twenty to thirty centimeters of soil back in. And, uh, so it goes all the way up to this section up here, which looks a little bit of a mess right now. Mm -hmm. 
So the water from the wash and pack room comes out here. This actually used to go down the side of the herb garden and into a drain, um, a house drain. But um, I said, why not kind of use this water? Um, it can be a water source for the pond, especially in the summer when the levels are gonna drop with heat. Um, and this is gonna be clean enough water. Um, and what I'm gonna have it do is filtering through rocks. So you kind of clean out any sediment. There's gonna be bits of lettuce or microgreens definitely that come out here. And you don't want a lot of nutrient going into that pond really. Um, I just want clean fresh water going in. So the water will come out here. Um, out of this pipe, as I said, I'll build a concrete drain down here um, and have it filtering through a lot of rock into the pond. And that's our, that's our water source for the pond. Um, and there's a lot of water in this pond, so what I also view it as is a, a kind of a, a repository or a backup water source. As you know, weather events are becoming more and more extreme. And who's to say there won't be drought in this parts of the, these parts of the country? I know it's um, hard to imagine, given the amount of rainfall. But in the summer, the summers, the dry spells have been getting uh, a bit longer. Um, so if, if there's a case where I'm having a particularly dry spell, or there's an issue with the well, um, I could just hook up a solar pump here and um, hook that straight into my water source for the vegetable beds and the polytunnels. But the primary reason for this pond is really building habitat, encouraging more wildlife onto the farm. The plan for this pond is leave it be, let nature find it. Um, let the plants, the animals, insects move in here and, and colonize it. Over time, this will this will be a lush habitat, I've no doubt. Um, life will be flourishing. And that's going to bring balance to the whole farm, particularly the market garden behind me. So just a quick look at the no-dig mar market garden. Um, it's even questionable to call this a market garden because there's still only four beds. Um, the plan is for the market garden to one day span this entire section. That will mean approximately 40 beds, I think. But for now, I got four beds built this year, and even though I wanted a lot more, it was a little bit of a blessing that there were only four because that was just a very manageable amount for me to get started with and pro provided a lot of food, would you believe, from these four 10 meter beds. Uh, basically, kept us fed all summer. Um, and as you can see, there's still plants in every bed. So these two beds behind me, I recently sowed onion in this bed and garlic in this bed. Um, and this is the perfect time of year to sow these. Um, the onions are two sets and the garlics are two sets as well. These will overwinter really well. You can see they're already starting to come up through the ground. Um, and they'll give me a really nice crop in June or July. Um, and the garlic are amazing. You sow basically one clove out of a bulb and that itself will divide and provide you with a whole new clove of garlic. And that actually needs cold weather in order for that to happen. So that's why we sow them in the winter. So these two beds here, um, I used this year to grow a huge variety of crops, mainly to get a lot of experience in growing the, the different crops, but um, it ended up using ended up using a lot of these um, plants for salad and lettuce and I was selling uh, mixed bags of lettuce down into a local shop in Middleton during the summer. Um, other than that we were growing turnip, broccoli, beetroot, spinach, cauliflower and that was feeding us in the house. Um, I've left all these plants in the ground, they're not in production anymore. Um, there are a few turnips and bits of broccoli and pieces here that I am using but the salad plants I've left in the ground and the reason is it's just better to keep living roots in the soil. The other alternative is cutting the plants and 
letting the weeds grow. So in a way, uh, these plants are keeping the ground covered, stopping weeds growing this time of year. But the main reason I'm keeping these plants here is for the benefit of the soil. Uh, and keeping biology active in the soil, keeping nutrient cycling. And when I eventually cut down these plants, I leave them on top of the soil to, um, to decay and release those nutrients back into the soil. These are broccoli plants that I sold in late summer. We got a few cuts of uh, broccoli heads from these. So what I'll do with these beds soon is I'll cut down all the foliage, let it sit on top of the bed, cover with a geotextile and let all that foliage break down and then in spring I should be able to take back the cover and have a nice uh, weed free um, friable bed and that I can plant straight into. Even at this time of year there's food in the garden. Got beetroot here and down here we have uh, some turnip and best way to store these is in the soil. This is a pretty typical site after a storm. The plastic will just not stay down. I just I'm so sick of it. Can't wait to get rid of all this plastic. So here I am at the perennial patch. Down the bottom of that perennial patch is still the very first piece of land I cultivated on these three acres. So it'll always be a bit special. Um, so with the perennial patch in winter, I really don't do a lot. Um, I've just uh, gone through it recently with a hoe to remove some of the weeds. A lot of the plants just die back themselves. There's not a lot of annuals here, apart from there was nasturtiums here. As you can see, they've dropped a load of seed. So they just, they'll all come back next year and that's fine. Um, this is a comfrey plant here that's just um, completely died back and all those leaves are releasing their fertility back into the soil. So this is a kind of um, very self-sustaining patch. The only times I intervene here in this patch really are if I see um, weeds like nettle or dock growing. Um, and then occasionally uh, during the year I'll cut back some of the foliage so I can walk through these paths. Other than that, um, it pretty much looks after itself. This row here is there's a lot of perennial fruit. Strawberries pretty much run the whole way up. Um, got some shallots here, gooseberry, blueberry, more gooseberry, more blueberry, chives which um, really grow beautifully in the summer and the flowers are amazing. So these are the Egyptian walking onions. They're called walking onions because uh, I haven't seen it yet but at the tip they will grow bulblets, little small, they look like small onions and then this plant, this leaf will die, fall over, it'll plant the bulblet into the soil and the uh, onions walk down the bed. Kind of cool. So this here is a cover crop of mustard. Um, a cover crop is basically just a crop that I'm sowing to keep the ground covered and to return fertility to the soil. Um, so this is keeping this section weed free. Uh, this grew potatoes all last year. Um, once the potatoes are finished I just scattered mustard seed and it's grown into a fine crop. It, um, it is flowering and starting to form seed, so I will cut it soon because uh, you, you don't want this seeding. And similar to the lettuce and salad, I'm just going to cut all this at the base um, and let the foliage sit on top of the bed, which will act as uh, a mulch to keep weeds away. And it, once that's broken down in spring, I'll have a, a nice clean bed to sow into. I think I might do wildflowers here next year. I love this little section here. This is mint. Um, it's a mix of spearmint and chocolate mint in here. Um, mint is very invasive, so it does need to be kept in check a little, little bit because this grows right into the path. So I do need to keep an eye on it. 
um, but I love in the summer and spring when this is just a green oasis and the smell is amazing I can come down here pick a few leaves of mint and make tea um, mint is a must so behind me here at the bottom market garden section is a little bit of an experiment where I wanted to uh, trial out more cover cropping uh, so I sowed in here a mix of cereal rye, mustard, uh, phacelia and clover and uh, it has germinated very sp um, sparsely um, but uh, Around the edges here, for example, it didn't germinate at all for some reason. I think that's maybe because there was very heavy rains shortly after I sowed this and the water kind of just pooled at the bottom. Um, but it's, it's st we'll still see what it looks like as we get into the spring. It might start growing rapidly. Um, this section is really planned for a fruit cage meter wide beds and a variety of different fruit bushes and trees in there that'll all be protected from the birds so so I didn't want to make the tragic pond jealous by talking about the new pond so much um, but this pond has settled quite well now it still has its own water source which is uh, piped water with a float valve so when the when the level of this pond drops it kind of refills itself from the water source. You can see there's vegetation in the middle that's spiked water milfoil and I've actually had to remove a lot of that recently. It's scattered all around the pond and um, I went in recently with my wellies and got destroyed and pulled it out because it was uh, completely taking over. It's a really invasive plant. It is a good plant to have in a pond, it's an oxygenator in that it returns oxygen to the water to make more available for plants and insects, but you need to control it a little bit. Um, and it's good to have um, plants in your pond because they're going to mop up any excess nutrients, otherwise you'll just start to see algae growing. Behind the compost bay here, I've tarped the section black plastic. This is the same black plastic that I used over in the area last year to grow courgette and squash and it's exactly what I'm going to do here next year. Um, and it's always good to rotate um, crops to different areas every year to stop build up of pests and diseases. So I'm just behind the nursery tunnel here and right here is the first of hopefully many growing tunnels. This tunnel is 15 meters by 6 meters and uh, it's freezing. I set it up so hopefully um, I would fit four of this size tunnel all the way down to the fence and I already have them plumbed for water um, and this one is also plumbed for water and electricity. Uh, there's a little underground valve box under the plastic so it's also set up to the automated system so I'll be able to control timing um, and everything from my phone and from the Wi-Fi controller. Um, this is almost ready. Um, the next step here is to build the beds using the um, materials up here. I've got a lot of horse manure and wood chip there. So similar to the no day beds, they're going to be 75 centimetres uh, with 45 centimetre wood chip pads. The beds themselves will be um, about 12 to 13 metres. Um, and in this tunnel uh, next year I'll be able to grow all of the indoor crops like tomatoes. Uh, peas I think will do much better inside here because the wind is so bad. Um, cucumbers, melons, whatever. Uh, the world is my oyster in that tunnel. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting the beds here built soon, getting the plastic on 
and this will hopefully be operational in 2024. The wind is starting to pick up now and it's starting to get absolutely perishing. Just a quick look at the compost bay. Um, so the compost bay is uh, one of the structures I built this year. It's got five bays, roughly 1.2 meters. Just to show what the compost looks like. You can see it's really broken down. It's looking like good stuff. It's still quite uh, wood chippy because the wood chip takes a lot time a lot longer to break down but the wood chip is a lovely natural source of carbon uh, so this hopefully will be compost i can i can use in the spring um, so it is really nice to be able to um, build my own compost and this is going to be huge source of fertility for the farm over the years to come. I just had to get inside for a small bit. It's just brutal. It's that wind. The, it's not particularly cold. It's a really mild winter, but it's just the wind. The wind is so cold. Um, so I'm in the nursery tunnel now. Growing microgreens has really suited me this winter. It's something I can do indoors. It doesn't take a lot of my time. They grow really fast. We've got a bit of supplemental light here. Um, I've got automatic um, misters above, so they get watered for a few minutes every morning. And this is a heated bench. This, this, there's a, a heat cable going through this sand. So these are optimal conditions for these plants. Um, I harvest these typically after 10 days up to two weeks. Um, so I've got radish, pea, broccoli and coriander on the go here um, and eating a lot of it myself these are these are great food I hate the term superfood but I think microgreens are actually a bit of a superfood they can contain anything from 10 to 40 times more nutrients than their parent plant and they're quite tasty and you actually get the taste of the parent plant so if you're eating radish or broccoli you do get that taste um, of radish or broccoli um, you can just throw them into your salads, garnish your meals, whatever. I just actually make even a whole salad of microgreens mixed together with a bit of oil and balsamic and they're beautiful. And uh, there's a bit of a demand for them even locally here. I didn't think there would be, but um, I started bringing down a few box boxes at the end of the summer and uh, people have quite enjoyed them, especially when there's not a lot of fresh produce this time of year. So yeah, I actually quite enjoy the microgreens. It doesn't take a lot of my time. And um, I love getting the feedback that people are eating and enjoying them. So it suits everybody. Finally got through all the washing as well recently. This had piled up with loads of pots and trays and that bucket is supposed to contain stuff that needs to be washed, but it ended up filling the whole bench. And I don't want to let that happen again next year. This is my section for storing trays and pots and order is restored so a couple of days ago I trimmed the hedge um, surrounding the herb garden which is all willow um, and from those those hedge uh, trimmings I took a lot of cuttings of willow which I plan to create new plants with next year um, so they're just sitting in water right now and even even this by uh, letting these sit in water you should start start seeing roots grow out of these in the next few weeks um, all of these have the uh, capacity to grow a whole new tree and this is actually even what i planted last year around the herb garden just stick these in the ground just like that and um, it's just mind-blowing how that can grow a new tree and willow are particularly good for cuttings. Um, so what we have here is a grape plant. What I love about these two plants is that these are grown from seed and no ordinary seed. We've got a couple of plants here that are just overwintering and ready. they'll be ready to go into the ground in spring. So you got some, I think this is lovage. I've got my sweet peas planted for next year. These are all looking nice and leafy. 
and these are all grown from seed um, from last year's plants. Got some lavender going here, smells great. A mallow plant, uh, we've got coriander. So these are just kind of uh, getting a head start, getting a head start on next year. Uh, the plants will be ready to go into the ground a bit earlier. Um, in October 2022, I was on holidays in Cyprus with Alina and we're, we stopped in this mountain town and it was really quaint, quiet, nobody around and we we're walking through all the back streets and there was a there was a grapevine hanging over the wall of a house and I just plucked a couple of grapes off um, and I ate them and then I spit out the seeds and I thought why don't I just keep these seeds and just bring them home and see what happens um, so when I got home I planted the seeds nothing happened for a long time then one day I came in and almost all at the same time and they were all planted in separate containers they all germinated uh, three of them um, so I couldn't believe it so I nurtured the plants kept them on the heat and kept them watered um, so when the tomatoes finished this year I planted them in the ground and they're starting to take off I've given them a bit of uh, support here so I want them to start to start climbing up onto these uh, metal frames and up um, I don't know if they'll produce fruit um, they're from the mountains in Cyprus which is a lot different than the hills of Middleton um, but even if they do grow up to be nice leafy plants I'll be happy enough with that and um, fruit will be a bonus um, so I just love that there's a story behind these grapes I'm not I'm not wasting time so I don't have to go back outside I really don't want to go out there again so um, we might make a dash for the wash and pack room Oh God, it's so cold. Gonna wrap this up with a little tour of the wash and pack room. So, I'll spin around. This room is approximately six meters by seven meters. Behind me here is a cold room that I picked up on the internet. I had to go and collect it, take it apart, bring it back here, put it back together. Uh, I can't believe that happened, but I had uh, help from a lot of friends, including um, a guy with a big trailer, which was very much necessary. Um, this cold room is three meters by three meters. There's not a lot in here right now, but it's pretty much a cold room planning for the future. Um, the shelving came with it, which is great. Had a pretty good deal. Uh, I keep my uh, seeds here, these are my microgreen seeds, and my green manure seeds, and my beer seeds. Uh, there's no harm up there, this is the good stuff, yellow belly beer. And uh, this is a sack of um, microgreen peas. Uh, as if it wasn't cold enough, I had to go and stand in the cold room which to be fair, the temperature is not that different from outside. This is a supply shelf. So stuff here like uh, hygiene, it's pretty important to me. So stuff like isopropanol here, which I use to spray on surfaces and for cleaning the um, washing equipment, like the, the drying rack, cleaning surfaces. I might spray my tools with it. Um, I have a food grade hydrogen peroxide, which I would use on the microgreens if I feel there's potential for mold. Um, vinegar for cleaning tools as well, hand soap, and then this is just a general sanitizer here for cleaning surfaces. Uh, my paper towels, uh, some catering equipment here for like when I have people or volunteers or some sort of things. Tea warm, um, serving cold drinks. God, it's cold. Uh, the freezer, the freezer was a good addition as well. Um, so, like for example, I froze gooseberries from I got earlier in the year. I think 
get a lot of berries this year, but uh, once I start getting a lot more berries, I'll just freeze them. Um, over here is just a little desk for pretending that I sit down and do office work. So the workflow for washing and drying food is not fully defined yet. I'm still kind of figuring it out. Uh, but typically it's going to be salad and I'm going to harvest in this sort of crate. I'll bring the crate in, put it on this table here. And I wash it in the uh, sink, one sink and then into the other one. And then I used to have drying racks here, which have since gone. Um, this is the new drying rack, uh, a big improvement on the old drying racks, mainly because they've got electric fans. So these are just regular um, house fans that I got in a hardware shop um, that I took apart. Then I just took the stand off them and mounted them on top of this rack. I added some lights that I got from uh, Amazon. Over here is a wireless button which basically just turns on a plug. All of these three fans are plugged into an extension cord and then this uh, wireless button here basically turns on that extension cord and fans go on, food dries. Uh, this has been absolutely great. Um, I wouldn't change a thing here. Um, and what's really nice is the way it can just spin over and you can just tap the back and uh, knock off any excess, it's really easy to clean. And uh, yeah, this is also good for um, drying equipment when I'm finished with the salad spinner. Um, microgreen trays, I wash them over in the sink and let them dry on this. So, um, yeah, that's the drying rack. Now, over to this strange looking contraption here. This is the new salad bugger. So previously everything was washed in these sinks. This is where um, I plan to wash salad in the future. Um, it's really designed for salad in large amounts. It's, it's not worth using and wasting that amount of water unless I'm producing large amounts. Um, and I do plan on scaling up the salad production. So this is, base, this is a cattle trough. This is not designed for a washing salad. Um, I bought this from a, a farm supply um, store. I had to add the drains myself. So there's three drains. They're, they're kind of push release drains. Um, and that's uh, plumbed to the sink. So it'll drain out the same pipe that the, drain, the sink drains from, uh, which as I spoke about earlier, will all go to the pond now. So I do have to be very careful what I put down that sink and make sure there's no chemicals uh, or stuff like vinegar, you know. Um, so this tank fills by turning this switch here and water starts coming out, which I don't want to fill now. There is a float valve underneath this yellow hood here, which means that water only fills up as far as this level. Uh, so which means I can turn on that switch, go outside and harvest my lettuce and I'll walk away and it shouldn't overflow. Right, so this this white pipe here, it's a it's regular waste pipe, but it's not designed to carry waste, this is designed to carry air. Um, this is going all the way up the wall here into the other room. At the end of this pipe in the other room, might as well show you, is a jacuzzi pump. Yeah, and it's uh, enclosed in this box, which I, I added the box just to minimize the noise. And there's some holes at the back to allow air uh, intake. Right, so jacuzzi pump there. Um, it pumps air through the white pipe and then down into here. What you can't see here really, maybe you can, are tiny little holes that are drilled into this pipe. So essentially what you have when the water is full and you turn on, it sounds like, just sounds like a hooper. Air is coming out of these holes now. 
what you're going to get is a jacuzzi effect. You're going to see this bubbling like crazy. And what that is, is agitation. It's going to start cleaning the salad leaves. So I'll dump all the salad leaves in here. They start bubbling around. It'll start loosening the dirt and the insects off the salad leaves. It'll go to the bottom. It'll allow me to scoop the clean salad leaves off the top, bring them over to the drying rack and uh, actually no before before to go to the drying rack they still need to be spun in a salad spinner which is this here uh, but I do have plans for an automatic salad spinner as well which I'll show you later maybe um, so I have that on a two minute timer um, which should be enough so yeah it's a wacky looking contraption it's not my invention. There's many of these out there. I don't know if there's many people in the, in in Ireland in this. Um, a lot of people tend to not clean the salad here and, and sell it um, sell it straight from the field. I kind of want to do things different. I don't know if I'm taking on too much by committing to washing and drying, but I really think it's going to add to the the final product. I think it adds to the shelf life when you when you wash and dry a product. Um, so, um, either way, I had fun building this, and, um, but I really think it's going to be uh, a huge addition um, and will improve the the salad product for me. My, this will work for microgreens as well. Um, however, microgreens don't require as much agitation. The microgreens are very fragile, so that's why I put in this kind of variable switch here, which will allow me to kind of change the, change how much air is coming out of the holes. So I want a little bit less agitation for the microgreens and I kind of want more for the salad leaves. So this is a salad bubber. I haven't actually, ran it yet I filled it up just to make sure it drains okay but um, and I've tested it um, and I've, I found out that the holes on the first contraption I drilled were too big and it wasn't bubbling the whole way it wasn't bubbling over this side so it was losing power so this is the second time I've tried it I haven't actually even tested it with the smaller holes yet but I think it'll work um, I fitted a tap here as well, um, basically to allow me to clean the tank after use. And uh, that's the salad bubbler. Oh, these two things as well. So these are just basically <coughs> lengths of pipe with uh, caps on the end, and I'm going to fill these with sand uh, because this. Uh, this pipe likes to try and float when there's water in here, so these are essentially going to act as weights and keep this keep this in place. So for bubbling microgreens, um, I don't want to use this big tank because it's just it's too big and it's wasting too much water for a um, small amount. So I've built a similar mechanism for the sink and again held down with these weights which are filled with stone um, and the pipe is just um, connected to the same air source so I can just very quickly clip this out connect this mechanism and hit the on button and this is what it looks like so it is essentially um, a jacuzzi, which is not a very hot one. And the idea is you drop the microgreens in here, the bubbles agitate and clean the microgreens. And uh, yeah, pretty simple. So this is the future side. It's So, 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 this is the future salad spinner. This is a 
top loading washing machine which are really hard to find here because they are um, they're mostly found in the US um, so um, I'm going to retrofit this to wash salad I don't know how yet I have an idea um, there's some YouTube videos on uh, with detailed instructions basically I'm going to have to remove this central agitator here um, do a bit of grinding around the sides to make this bigger this whole section is going to go and we're essentially going to only going to use the spinning function in this to spin that basket of salad um, a little bit crazy but plenty of people have done this successfully and uh, I know it's possible so I just need to spend a few hours maybe days figuring this out for the moment I still have my um, my hand salad spinner so there's no rush on this but <laughs> stay tuned you know it is always good to reflect on the year and if I look back at 2023 you know a lot of good things happen <laughs> Uh, the highlight being that I started selling my produce to, to people and getting that, that joy of the feedback, knowing that people are bringing your food home and eating it and maybe sitting down with the family and enjoying food that, food that I grew gives me incredible satisfaction and um, that was just through a chance uh, conversation in a shop that I would usually go down to and pick up a few bits and pieces. And the owners were just really um, encouraging and supportive in what I was doing. And they uh, were really keen on getting some local produce into their shop. So they just, they just told me to bring down whatever you have. No pressure on volumes or quantities. Um, and I started bringing the salad bags, which started doing quite well. Um, and from then the microgreens. So we'll keep that going into next year as well. Um, I don't want to overwhelm myself either. What else happened last year? So we dug the pond, which is great. Got the compost bay finished. I, I guess the polytunnel is three quarters of the way there. We still have to build the beds and put the plastic on. Um, the herb garden was another addition last year um, that had a great summer. It added so much life to the farm and, and it's so close to the house that we can just run out every now and then and grab a few herbs to bring in for cooking. The tragic pond was built in March of this year. That's been a great addition, um, if a little bumpy at the start when it wouldn't keep water, but we got that sorted in the end. We planted the food forest, which uh, did have a deer attack, but I think that's going to bounce back. Added four no day beds, and planted a huge variety of vegetables over the season. We fed ourselves for a lot of the summer. We had the courgette, pumpkin and squash patch, which was the most bountiful patch, I think, because those courgette plants were so giving. Couldn't even get through half of them. Um, so I have another patch planned for next year behind the compost to grow more courgettes and squash. The perennial patch was extended, a lot, a lot of new plantings there, and that just came into its own again this year. We had the potato patch. Um, so we got, we got beautiful varieties of potato out of there. The Vitabella and Sevilla were the early varieties and then we had Sarpomira, they those as the main crop. We had our deer attack, which was fun. All the new additions to the pack room, salad bubbler. We had Bellyfest, which was, I uh, forgot about that. That was just a little event that I hosted for friends and neighbors. It kind of spiraled out of control and got bigger than I thought it would be, but it was unbelievable. An Italian friend of mine came up and cooked the best pizzas I've ever tasted in my life. And the nice thing is we were using um, harvest from the farm as well. Like we were using courgettes and onions and garlic. And uh, it was just brilliant. And that absolutely has to happen again. And who knows, who knows how big that can get. But what was lovely about that was the car park was full. 
people were all in this room. We were serving salads and desserts and just beautiful. What a, what a night it was. And that's what it's all about. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this is to, is to bring people together, bring communities together. Um, this, this place has the potential to host so many more events like that and more. Um, I think this place has the potential for a farm shop where people can come just for a Sunday walk around um, to get to just walk around and immerse themselves in nature and sit by a pond go pick some herbs pick some fruit bring it home um, there's so many possibilities here but it's going to take a lot of time and step by and we just take it step by step so next year um i want to build some more storage areas for the tractor implements there's a lot of stuff just lying around in the field that's um not doesn't look great so storage area i want to take a lot of the tractor implements like the post hole digger and the flail mower i think they should be outside but they should also be covered so I want to build a kind of little barn outside somewhere to store all of those and maybe some of the market garden equipment like the nets and fleeces. And there's a lot of building equipment just lying around like sand and bricks and um, water pipe. I just want to get that all into one place. I want to be organized. So that's one of the big goals is to organize better. We definitely want to build more no dig beds next year. Um, We've only four, and that produced a lot of food. Um, so maybe we can get up to 10, maybe. So more no dig beds. We have the compost, we have the wood chip, we have the templates, we have the, the process. We just need to go and do it. Finish the polytunnel, get the beds built in there, and that hopefully will be a growing space for next spring. Landscaping the area around the pond. So I want to build that circle in the middle with stone and I might have a go at building those concrete benches myself. Uh, if not, I'll get a professional, but I think it's worth a try. Um, planting trees and plants around that area as well. Experimenting a bit more with uh, copper crops next year. I think they are, again, one of the things I took from Jim Cronin is the power of these cover crops. How they're not only covering your soil, but they're providing the biology, the life, the nutrients back into the soil. So I definitely want to introduce more cover crops. The fruit cage is another thing I'm working on. Um, so my idea of a fruit cage is polytunnel hoops covered with a netting. And within the polytunnel then loads of fruit trees in rows, maybe even a spalliard. And the netting would be kind of small enough so a sparrow wouldn't get through. And what, what this will do, will it, it will allow fruit to thrive really. So with a fruit cage, it just means that you're, you're not worrying about the birds stealing all your produce because when fruit ripens, it can be a matter of days before uh, all the fruit's gone because the birds are just so tuned in to when it's ripe. If you happen to be away for a weekend or, or gone, just don't happen to look at a certain plant in a few days, the berries can all be gone. So the fruit cage would host a variety of different plants like raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, maybe even a few fruit trees. I, and again, more perennials added, more life, more diversity. The fruit plants still need a lot of work and maintenance, but there's not a lot of people providing organic fruit locally. When you look at the supermarket and see all of our fruit, almost all of our fruit, our raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, come from countries like Morocco, Spain, very far away, and they grow fine here. So I'm thinking, why not build a fruit cage, protect it, and uh, have an abundance of organic fruit that I can sell. I've also a woodland plan for next year that's going to go up in the north east section so it's a kind of a shaded area already 
Um, there's not a lot going on there, it's just pasture. I've got a grant of about over 200 trees coming to me in January from a crowd called Trees on the Land. Um, and I've got those trees for free. Um, it's a non-profit organization. It's really fantastic. Um, I just had to make an application, send me my plans, uh, what I'm gonna do with the trees. Um, so what I might do is in January sometime organize a bit of a volunteer event and just go through the planting of those 200 trees in one day. That, that will be a beautiful woodland in maybe 20 years time and that's really exciting and again more diversity, more interest. Um, so, so even though the farm operates as one system, by having uh, loads of different habitats dotted around will just add to the life and biodiversity. So you're going to have a woodland up in the top corner, we'll have two wetland areas with the ponds, um, maybe a meadow area which I plan for one day which uh, is a sward of different types of wildflowers. You've got your market garden, um, a perennial patch, so all working together. Um, that's the dream. So that's some of the plans for next year. I'm still freezing, even though I'm indoors, I'm going to call it a day there. So that's it. Um, I absolutely love what's happening here. I'm really excited for 2024. I wish you all a happy new year. Um, stick around for the journey. Um, follow me on Instagram if you want. Um, I post a little bit more regularly there. And um, yeah, see you soon.